Sweet. Yeah, I was just saying, uh, Patrick, that before before I hit record, that the last couple of weeks here in the uh, in the US, I've I've been enjoying the Oxygen Advantage your book um, as I've been out on my runs. I've got the audio books going, and uh, yeah, I'm a big fan of, of of just the world of of breath work, and it's something that I'm learning so much about and still delving right into. And 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 my audience knows all about the interview I did with James Nestor, and it was a a really well received one. So I think there's a a bit of an appetite for uh, for the subject on here, especially. But I was trying to think about the best way to kickstart the conversation. I thought I would throw a, a question that I'm often asked mm. that you'd be far more qualified to answer, and and then we could we could take it from there. And the question was, uh, hey, as a runner, are we supposed to breathe through our nose or through our mouth? Mm. Yeah, it's a popular question. Um, in terms of breathing, the mouth does absolutely nothing. It's a hole. So always bear that in mind. It's It just allows air to go straight down the throat into your lungs. In terms of running with the mouth closed, we understand that at a certain intensity of running, when the air hunger gets too much, you have to switch to mouth breathing. That's typically taught to be about 35 to 41 liters of air per minute. But even in, in this couple of small studies that they looked at, when individuals switched from mouth to nose breathing, they were still able to attain 85% and 90% of their work rate intensity. There's an adaptation that takes place when you first switch from mouth to nose breathing. And the reason that the air hunger is stronger with nose breathing is because carbon dioxide is not able to leave the body so quickly. Carbon dioxide is the primary drive to breathe. So when you do your physical exercise, your muscles are producing more carbon dioxide because carbon dioxide is produced as a byproduct of the metabolism. So you've got increased carbon dioxide coming into the blood and blood pH drops and the brain reacts by sending an increased stimulus to breathe. So you're feeling that increased sensation of air hunger. Now, of course, there are other factors which drive your breathing, but carbon dioxide is the primary stimulus to breathe. If you do running with your mouth closed, initially the air hunger is stronger. But if you continue doing your running with the mouth closed, the air hunger diminishes. And what this means is that the body is adapting down towards a higher tolerance of carbon dioxide. So when that individual runs, they then have higher carbon dioxide in the blood. And this, is ha this has advantages in terms of dilating blood vessels, but also increased oxygen delivery to the working muscles. So there's better recovery. It's really surprising, Tyson, when you think of all of the sports medicine scientists in the world, very few of them have investigated nose breathing versus mouth breathing during exercise. It's bizarre beyond belief. Like we've been working with this for 20 years. Breathing is hot now. It wasn't hot in 20, but I am saying no difference now than I was in 2002. And if you look at the book, Close Your Mouth, I wrote it back in 2003. Ask Me Free Naturally in 2004. Um, you know, in other books as well that like, this information has been around for a long time. There was one study in 1995 by a researcher in Australia called Morton. And he looked at what happens when you switch from mouth to nose breathing during exercise. The fraction of exp expired oxygen is less. In other words, our body utilizes oxygen better. Now, a few other things about the importance of nose breathing during exercise. There seems to be a cognitive effect. You know, if we do slow breathing during rest, if we then do nose breathing during physical exercise, there's going to be some resistance to our breathing because the nose is smaller than the mouth and that can affect um, cognitively. So for people who may run to help ease anxiety or to help clear the mind, well, nose breathing is going to be more advantageous than mouth breathing. Nose breathing involves greater recruitment of the diaphragm. Mouth breathing typically involves greater recruitment of the upper chest. All you have to do is look down at your chest and take the breath through the mouth. And you'll see that mouth breathing engages more the upper chest. But in the human lungs, the greatest concentration of blood is in the lower lobes. So there's a better gas exchange that takes place when you breathe through your nose versus your mouth. And this was discovered back in 1988, that the partial pressure of oxygen in the blood increases by 10% with nasal breathing. Mm. 20 to 50% of athletes have exercise induced bronchoconstriction. May not be asthma, but they have narrowing of the airways. Why? Because of taking the cold, dry, unfiltered air straight down their throat into their lungs, and it causes airways to narrow. Many athletes are prone to respiratory issues, including cyclists, cough, etc. 
that's made worse by breathing through the mouth. Mouths, mouth breeders also have more dental health issues. Runners can have bad teeth, and this can be related to running time. Okay, aside from the sports drinks that they drink, but the fact that if you're running and you have a dry mouth, bacteria is more rampant, dental health is going to be, is going to be sacrificed. Mouth breathing during sports, you're more likely to be dehydrated because when you breathe out through your nose, the body conserves water. It captures, it captures the water. So basically, when we have an exhalation out through our nose, the nose recovers the moisture on the exhale breath. So there's a 42% greater water loss through your mouth. So your nose is there to, to recover the, the heat and moisture from the exhale breath. So you're less likely to be dehydrated. So I think all in all, I think the biggest ones with nose breathing are the adaptations that take place. One sports medicine scientist, George Dallum, he got 10 recreational athletes. He had them breathe through their nose exclusively for six months. And then he measured their ventilation post post six months in comparing mouth breathing with nose breathing. With nose breathing, they were able to attain 100% of their work rate intensity, but with 22% less ventilation. So if you think of an athlete, you know, being able to do 100% of your work rate intensity with 22% less ventilation is there's an economical saving there because the respiratory muscle can be prone to fatigue. And also it costs energy to breathe. You know, breathing, the breathing muscles need oxygen. Mm. And as we sit here, it could be two to 3% of our oxygen consumption mm. is going to support the breathing muscles. But if you're doing intense exercise, it might be 10%. If you're doing high maximum exercise, it could be 15%. But if you're dysfunctional breathing, you're going to consume more. And this dysfunctional breathers, which we should really go through, are going to be more prone to disproportionate breathlessness and fatigue. Mm. And uh, yeah, so I think the benefits of nose breathing outweigh mouth breathing so much. And I understand that, yes, there's a time that you have to switch to mouth breathing. But if you go to a local gym, and you look in the door and you'll see people in there and they're doing mild to moderate exercise. Mouths are opening. Does not make sense. They go mm. for a walk. They can't even go for a walk with their mouths closed. You know, somebody needs to tell these people what their nose is for. Yeah, it's really interesting. That's a, it's a great answer. And actually, after I, after I spoke to James Nestor uh, about 18 months ago on here, I went and it sort of explored that idea a little bit more and made a YouTube video of, about what I'd been learning. And it's been, it's the most popular video on, on the Relax Running YouTube page. And I, I read through the comments every now and then. And so many people say, hey, I can, I can understand the benefits. I can understand how important it is. But unfortunately, my, my nose is just too blocked up. Even if I try and breathe through my nose, like my, uh, uh, I'm not sure, like there's so many different things, but Deviated essentially there's- septum polyps, et cetera, yeah. Exactly right. Exactly right. So these people, they, they sort of ask me questions about, uh, and I'm definitely not qualified in this area at all. I was just sort of more sharing what I'd learned through people like yourself uh, and trying to make sense of it for me. But uh, how do you how do you sort of approach that conversation? Because obviously these are a lot of my audience are, are runners. Um, and if these people want to make that transition, but they have deviated septums, nasal polyps and little obstructions that, that might limit their ability to do so, what do people like this do? Sure, if, if the nose is reversibly obstructed, you can decongest the nose pretty easy by holding your breath. And there's three ways to decongest the nose. One is by holding your breath. One is by doing physical exercise with your mouth closed, or the other is by having sex. So your listeners have three options there. They'll probably all choose the sex one. They'll forget about the other ones. <laughs> so to, to decongest the nose, you can simply do this as follows. Don't do this if you're pregnant. Don't do it if, you've, if you have any serious medical conditions. Um, but it's very simple exercise. Take a normal breath in and out through your nose, pinch your nose, hold your nose, and just jog in the spot, holding your breath. And then let go, breathe in through your nose, and breathe normal then for about a half a minute to a minute, and repeat it. And when you're jogging on the spot, holding your breath, continue jogging until you feel a moderate to strong air hunger. You don't have to do it until you go blue. None of this stuff is extreme. Mm -hmm. so especially for people with panic disorder and anxiety go a bit easier because the feeling of air hunger could put you into that fight or flight response so that's the first thing to do anytime your nose gets stuffy decongest your nose secondly 
if your bolt score is low, you're going to find it more challenging to do physical exercise with the mouth closed. And your bolt score is a measurement of your degree of breathlessness during physical exercise. How you breathe during rest determines how you breathe during running. And if you do your running with the mouth open, it will never improve your breathing. So running with your mouth open has no benefits whatsoever on your breathing. If you are going around with your mouth open during the day or having your mouth, if having upper chest breathing or faster breathing or noticeable breathing, that, those are the traits of dysfunctional breathing patterns and they will automatically occur as well during sports. So your breathing is amplified. You're more likely to be breathing harder and faster. You're more likely to gas out. So we work to improve the bolt score during rest. And by improving the bolt score during rest, you will reduce the degree of breathlessness during exercise. The bolt score is as follows, the bolt body oxygen level test. You take a normal breath in and out through your nose, you pinch your nose and you hold your nose and you time it in seconds until you feel the first definite desire to breathe or the first involuntary movement of the breathing muscles. And then you let go and you take that breath in and out through your nose, but your breathing should be normal. So it's not the maximum length of your breath hold time. Okay, so the first exercise that I did, the nose and blocking, you're holding your breath for as long as you can. The bowl score, you're not holding your breath for as long as you can. You're taking a normal breath in and out through your nose, you're holding your nose, you're pinching your nose to stop breathing, and you're timing it, how long does it take until you feel the first definite desire, but when you resume breathing, your breathing should be normal. If your bowl score is less than 25 seconds, your breathing is likely to be dysfunctional. And especially if an individual has a bolt score of 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 seconds, that is going to hold them back. And your bolt score is influenced by genetics, by if you had asthma or childhood asthma, hormonal changes with females, anxiety, panic disorder. So there's different things that influence your bolt score. Now, the other thing is the size of your nasal airway. I have a totally screwed up nose. You'll see that one side of my nose is smaller than the other. I've got a deviated septum. I can still jog, but I'm not an athlete, but I'll do very light stuff with my mouth closed. But what I do is I also have a nasal dilator. It's now one we des I designed it myself, but it's a little plastic device. I don't have it, but if you do this, if you put one finger either side of your nostrils mm -hmm. and gently just prise your nose, this is the cotton maneuver and you'll feel a difference. So we have a plastic device that goes up into your nose to know, open up the nose as opposed to a strip that goes across the bridge because the sweat can take that off. Whereas the plastic device opens up your nose and it's perfect for runners. And they're cheap. I think they're $15 or something. And they would last you for a year. Um, you could just rewash them. So, so yeah, so the three things that I would say to people is, go a bit slow, slower when you first switch from mouth to nose breathing and just think of the benefits and think that yes, you're, you're, it's a bit tougher because you're adding a load onto your breathing and it will take you a few weeks, not too long, mm -hmm. but it will take you a few weeks for your body to adapt. Number two, if you have a stuffy nose, it's important that you know how to decongest your nose. And the simplest way of opening up your mm -hmm. nose is breathe in and out through your nose, pinch your nose and hold your nose and gently jog, holding your breath, then let go and breathe in through your nose. Number three, if you're, you're get up, number three is to improve your boat score. Because if your bolt score is low, you will be breathing harder and faster during exercise. Number four, open up your nose using nasal dilator. And if I can make a shameless plug, just go to oxygenadvantage.com. You'll see nasal dilators there. They're very cheap. So I know that sounds a lot, but think of the benefits. You're protecting your teeth. You're protecting your airways. You've got greater recruitment of the diaphragm. You've got better oxygen transfer from the lungs into the blood. You've got better oxygen delivery. You've also better recovery post physical exercise. So it's worth it's worth the effort. Yeah, you mentioned uh, some of its genetic as well. The the bold score that is, and obviously everybody's facial features are built differently. But one thing I notice, like quite frequently, when I watch the East African runners, is most of the East Africans are running around with their mouth closed, even at intense pace. And uh, I'm not sure whether that's a genetic thing or whether they've yeah, got... Yeah, of course. Uh, yeah. There's, yeah. They've got tremendous noses. They've got a great nasal airway. They can do that. You know, if you look at their nostrils, um, they've, they're they just able to handle a greater volume of air. And I also, I often wonder as well, if, for example, if they're born at altitude or if they're spending a lot of time at altitude, 
Has their body adapted to that, which in turn then they've got better oxygen carrying capacity. So they can typically do more with less. So I think there's a combination of different things there. But yeah, there is a genetic influence. Caucasians don't have great nasal airways, um, especially, you know, person to person. And if you were a mouth breather as a child, it's likely that your nose is even screwed up more. Mm. Um, you know, we, we know that we know that mouth breathing during childhood years, that the face doesn't develop the way it should do. And as a result, the airway can, can be compromised. That's really interesting. That's a, a subject we could touch on maybe a little later because I'd be interested to find out a, a few of the strategies that parents out there might be able to uh, yes. introduce. I've got a, I'm looking outside at the moment. I can see my wife walking along with my, my little two-year-old boy who just loves running around. So I'd love to be able to give him some sort of advantage going into it. But um, with the bold score, what I was really curious to find out and, and, and um, sort of unpack a, a little bit more is obviously you mentioned some of the uh, the ability to develop that is genetics, like your natural foundation can be genetic, but um, some of the some of the practices that we can use is that is that simply through just developing our ability over time, um, you know, starting at a very slow pace, maybe a walk, then a slow jog, then gradually through more intense exercise, just breathing through the nose, our body's just uh, naturally developing that ability to be able to use the oxygen more more efficiently. That's it. That's yeah. it. But yeah. most people don't. They don't. Um, they, do, they don't unconsciously switch to nose breathing. You know, it's, it's only if they start thinking about it or they hear about it. Um, so yeah, it's, it's as simple as that. If, if, if somebody was a gardener out in the garden working manually all day, if they just breathe it through their nose, they will improve their breathing from a biochemical point of view, from a biomechanical point of view. Their breathing then during rest will be slower. It will be lighter. It will improve their sleep and it will also improve their states of mind. Because if you think of the autonomic nervous system, it's a balance between the relaxation, the rest and digest response and the stress response. But if the bolt score is low, breathing is faster. And when breathing is faster in upper chest, we're more likely to be an increased sympathetic drive. Hmm. So by adopting even during rest, because I think the biggest thing that we can do here is to change states. If we know the connection between our physiology and the mind, and there's so much misinformation out there about breathing there's so much nonsense and you know i think the best thing to do is when you hear of a breathing technique is put it into practice and first ask well what's the physiology behind it what's the reason reasoning and rationale not just something that's pulled out of the sky because there's plenty of stuff pulled out of the sky when it comes to breathing you have to think what's it actually doing you know look at the oxygen dissociation curve look at the bore effect Think of the trauma on the airways as a result of mouth breathing. Um, and, you know, even during rest, if you want to downregulate, you could take a very soft breath in and a really relaxed and slow, gentle breath out, and even under breathing to the point of air hunger, which in turn is going to improve your tolerance to carbon dioxide. And with an improved tolerance to carbon dioxide, your bowl score is higher and your breathlessness during physical exercise is going to be lighter. So it's not just about how you breathe during physical exercise, but it's also being conscious of how you're breathing during rest, but also during sleep. You should never wake up with a dry mouth in the morning. But yeah, physical exercise is a great start, you know. It's really interesting. I actually, I learned this through the magician, David Blaine, when he was training to hold his breath a little. I saw a couple of interviews with him and that was the first time that I'd ever heard that the, the problem when you're starting to panic for air isn't that you've lacked oxygen in your body. It's that the CO2 has built up so much in your body's natural response is, is to be able to get rid of that. And I think it might have been on Joe Rogan. And Joe Rogan asked him the question about, um, all right, well, it's really interesting. So what do you do? And he said, well, for me, I just gradually learned to get more comfortable with that discomfort. And then over time, it's amazing how beneficial that can be. And I Actually, I was, I was running along here in, in Medford, Oregon, a couple of weeks ago, as I said, listening to your book. And um, I think I got a little bit excited with the pace because it's, it's been the first time probably since I started listening to your book, really, that I've, I've made the commitment to actually really commit to this nose breathing and give it some time. Because I think my issue was, like a lot of runners out there, I can imagine, is I, I make that transition from what's comfortable, from what I've known, to doing this nose breathing and realize that, oh my gosh, like this feels a lot harder. And I, my issue as well, which I didn't consider, which you addressed in your book was, uh, you know, if you're doing a really difficult session, 
there's going to be a stage there where it might be, especially initially, really difficult just to stick to that nose breathing. And during that training phase, during that adaptation phase, sure, open your mouth if you really need to or, or slow down a little bit. But my issue had been, all right, I, I was like, okay, my nose just isn't right for this. And I didn't allow those those changes mm. to take place. But it's yeah. funny, I always look back to my uh, my year eight computer teacher. She used to try and teach us to touch type. And I remember sitting there one day and I, I had the index fingers and I was going like this. And she was trying to explain to me, no, no, you, you put your fingers like this and then you can just gradually move around. And she goes, just trust me, stick to it for the rest of the term. And if at the end of term, it's not working, you know, you can call me a liar. But I did it and, and she was right. Like she nailed it. Mm. And I was so glad I stuck to that initial discomfort. So I can see this in other areas of my life. In fact, every area of my life. Um, but I think just when it comes to seeing a temporary lapse in your performance in terms of time, it can be really hard for athletes to, to see that through. Is it, is it, I know in your book, you've mentioned, um, I can't remember his name, but there was a particular triathlete or cyclist who I think went through this phase. But I was, I was just curious to know whether that's a regular occurrence with athletes that you've seen. And also would love to hear a, about a couple of athletes that have really stuck through and seen some really positive uh, results as a, as a result of being consistent with that. Yeah, it's like I'll come back to David Blaine when he's talking about the breath hold. It's taught it's the discomfort signals from the diaphragm to the brain that terminates your breath hold. But of course, that's going to be influenced by carbon dioxide buildup and your brain sending increased sensations to breathe to the diaphragm. And then you have the discomfort signals from the diaphragm back up. So if you relax into that, and there's something very important about relaxing into the discomfort because you're training your brain not to react to discomfort. Suffocation is one of those, it's a very inbuilt mechanism. It's an inbuilt fear response in the human body. <clears throat> and in terms of building up resilience and stress, we don't want to do anything that's extreme. You know, Like I've made plenty of mistakes with this. I've worked with people, many, many people, face to face over 20 years. I've seen what can happen when breathing exercises, when they're not used correctly. I put one person into accident and emergency. Um, I've put people, plenty of people into panic attacks. And I've had people coming in with chronic fatigue syndrome. I've completely floored them. You know, and that's been over the years. And it's just kind of gave me an insight into it then that with some people, I have to go nice and easy and just gently build them up according to that individual. But the benefits of it can be enormous. They can be tremendous with people with anxiety, panic disorder, Lower back pain, 50% of the population with lower back pain have dysfunctional breathing. Asthma population, anybody with exercise induced bronchial constriction, sleep issues, um, physical exercise. We do breath holds as well. So breath holds are take a normal breath in and out through your nose, hold your nose and jog with your breath held. And you should be able to jog up to 80 pieces with your breath held and then let go and then get your breathing under good control. Don't expect it to do it straight off. So that's that's your upper limit of tolerance of breathlessness. We call that the maximum breathlessness test. So we have the bold score, which is functional breathing. And then for upper performance, it's the MBT. The MBT. Um, you'll see both of those tests anyway online. So coming back then to nasal breathing, it's not that we want people to go blue going for a run. You know, it's like some people can come back to me and says, Jesus. It was so difficult. It was almost like I was absolutely suffocated going for a run with my clothes. And I says, no, you know, do your best to sustain nasal breathing. You will feel a bit of air hunger. Once you have good control of your breathing, stick with that. If the air hunger gets too much, you can either slow down or breathe in through the nose and breathe out through the mouth. So you get rid of carbon dioxide from the body, which will help to alleviate the feeling of air hunger. But bear in mind, you do actually want to expose your body to that higher carbon dioxide because then you will reduce the chemosensitivity of the body to CO2 and then your ventilation is less for a given intensity and duration of exercise. And if the air hunger gets too much, you breathe in through your nose and out through your mouth. But then if you're slowing down in the pace, then you can go back to nose, mouth, and then nose, nose. So you can shift it up and down depending on your degree of breathlessness. But also think about your improving your bolt score. There's many people have been practicing this. We've many, many hundreds, thousands of people. Like the book is sold. Like the book was written back in when I don't know. I started writing that in 2012. 
and it was a four, three, three or right, maybe it was 2011. And it was published, I think, in 2015, 26, now, 16. I've since written a few more books after that. But the one that you talked about, the oxygen advantage is very much for kind of that sports performance. Like there's a man in it, Dr. William Hang. He's an orthodontist in the Gorey Hills in California. Um, I'm not sure what, how, what age he is now, but it's there, he's definitely mid 60s. He runs Martins with his mouth closed. So, you know, and he's a, he's a like, and, and doing pretty well with that. And his story is in the book. But if you Google him, Bill Hang, William Hang, he's an orthodontist. Face Focus is the name of um, his, his practice. But he's an orthodontist who understands about the airway. And that's why he is so religious about keeping his mouth closed because he understands the whole impact airway on your running, your sleep and everything and correct tongue resting posture, etc. There's plenty of others. Um, worked with some of the athletes from Notre Dame University back in 2016. They were sprinters now, track and field. 400 meter sprints and I wanted to push these guys a bit young kids great um, potential and really at the top of their game so we had them do some of their sprints with the mouth closed so yeah it's a challenge I know I don't normally do it with um, with athletes but we just did a challenge and then I remember some of the drills that I had them do was it was a 400 meter sprint, but I would stand on the 360 meter line. When they see me, they, they were sprinting. And then when they see me, they had to breathe in and breathe out and hold their nose and sprint the last 40 meters without, without breathing. Because what I wanted to do was I wanted to add the load onto the last 10% to get the body to make adaptations. You know, there's research on this with rugby union players in Australia professional rugby union players getting them to do 40 meter sprints with breath tolling and it increased their increased their repeated sprint ability from nine reps to 14.8 reps before exhaustion and the control group who were doing sprinting with normal breathing which normal breathing but during sprinting is mouth breathing no change um, if it came up by maybe one rep but very little change in comparison to the the experimental group who, who were doing breath tolls so Tyson, there's something in it because there's something in it because it's an area that has not been tapped into. Mm. And, you know, yeah, that's why I would say to people, like, kind of just build it up and it becomes comfortable. Now bring a tish tissue with you when you go for your run with your mouth closed. Um, your nose will drip. It'll run. That's just a part of the adaptation. Mm -hmm. And roughly, I know this is quite a broad question, but when someone makes the decision, like myself, I guess I'm a perfect example to go, all right, I'm going to try and make this my, my natural way to, to not only run, but just to get around in my day-to-day -day life. Is there a generic or a rough kind of uh, time estimate to, to say that, all right, if you stick to this for a month or two months, you're going to notice a 90% difference or a 100% you know, difference? Yeah, typically I would say the adaptation is about five to six weeks. And I would say estimate 90 to hundred percent. It's difficult to say because it's, how are you breathing outside of it? Mm. You know, if you have an individual in the workplace who's talking all day, if they're highly stressed, they have their mouth open during sleep. All of those things are factors that are going to hold you back. Um, but in saying that, you know, if you're doing competition, you can breathe, breathe the way you feel most comfortable with. If you are doing competition and you want to uh, reduce the risk of exercise induced bronchoconstriction, do some breath holds during your warm up because that helps to open up the airway. Like breath holds, breath holds are very interesting too because your spleen is your blood bank. It contains 8% of your red blood cells. And if you hold your breath for more than 30 seconds, your spleen starts releasing red blood cells into circulation. And these red blood cells are carrying your oxygen. So it increases VO2 max. And it's not known how long does it take then for the spleen to reabsorb that blood back. Some papers are 10 minutes and other papers that it's as high as 60 minutes. Your spleen, or sorry, when you do a long breath hold, you help open up your nose, you help open up your lungs. If you do a breath hold during training, you're putting a load onto the diaphragm. And even think about breathing through the nose if you're breathing mouth fast and shallow, you waste so much air to dead space. So the last 150 ml of breath doesn't get to the small air sacs in the lungs. So if you're breathing 20 breaths per minute, it means 20 by 150. 
hasn't got to the small air sacs in the lungs. If you breathe nose with slower breathing, but fuller breaths, it improves alveolar ventilation. So there's ways of just making tweaks to your existing breathing if you understand the physiology. Mm -hmm. And that's what we try to do, you know? And like a technique is only as good as somebody is going to be willing to put it into practice. So what I like to do is find out how do you do your warm up, How do you do your training? How do you do your cool down? What preparation do you have in terms of mental preparation for competition? How can we tweak that? getting balance in the autonomic nervous system, upregulate you if we need to, downregulate you if we need to, and then think about your sleep. And that's that's pretty much it, you know. It's really interesting. I, uh, I, I've i been doing a little bit of Wim Hof stuff on and off for the last couple of years. I'd like sure. to hear your thoughts on him. He's a bloke that's maybe um, marketed his message really well, but I don't think he has such a focus on, on nose breathing as much as the, the breathing technique. But in saying that, one of the things that, that I notice in the three rounds of breathing that you do um, using his style is exactly what you said, like that gradual breath hold. The first round of that breath hold is quite difficult. Um, and, and, you know, it might last a minute or two minutes or, or whatever. But then you get to that third round and all of a sudden the, the first round's maximum breath hold feels like a joke in comparison if you're doing it right. And I guess it's what you're speaking about implementing in the warm up before running. I, 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 I was thinking about that as I was listening to your book the other day, because I noticed that real advantage, but I'd never really considered that being a, um, my warm up was always a, a real physical thing in the sense that, okay, I'm here to warm up my legs. I'm here to do the stretches. So my legs feel good. And you ignore, or, or I, I personally back in my competitive running days really ignored a lot of the, um, uh, the breath <laughs> which is arguably even more important than than the other the other things um yeah it's it's really fascinating but one, one thing you said earlier patrick which was interesting to me and maybe the reason i'm so interested in this topic i've had two uh, separate sinus surgeries the last one was back in 2015 um i was getting ready for a third when uh, i found out i was i, I had allergies to dairy and I, I cut that out and that was sort of the game changer for me but in the lead up to that, uh, I'd been seeing a particular sports doctor and, uh, you know, she'd been just constantly putting me on antibiotics and saying this should help and nothing was really helping. She said, oh, but you've got exercise induced asthma as well. And uh, the more I learn about nose breathing, the, the funnier I thought this was, but she sent me into a hospital and they, they attached me to, I don't even know what it is. I'm sure you know the name uh, of it, but it's lung function test, spirometry. Yes. So I was, I was breathing into this for, I think it was at my maximum capacity for a, a couple of minutes. And then I had to take a couple of minutes off and, and do another round. And then that was evidence of, of exercise induced asthma, but um, you know, according to them, but it was, it's interesting hearing about some of this stuff and, and realizing that a test like that may be not as efficient as, as what we once thought based on the fact that like, I, I don't know the actual physiological reasons that, I'm coming back for a second round and not performing as highly as the first one, but surely it's got something to do with the whole test being based around just breathing through your mouth at a maximum capacity. Yeah. It's, it's bringing on the symptoms and um, two things with exercise induced rock constriction. Number one is get your bowl score above 20 and even better above 25 seconds. Absolutely. It's fundamentally important. I'll always say to anybody coming in, if your bowl score is less than 25 seconds, you're going to have that exercise induced bronchial constriction if that's your genetics. Number two, use your warm up as a period of helping opening up the airways and preparing the lungs prior to more intense physical exercise. So you're walking, you'll see this exercise in the book. So you're, you're doing light exercise in and out through your nose and then breathe in and out through your nose, pinch your nose and hold your breath for maybe 10 paces. Then let go. Continue jogging or light movement for about a minute or so, and then breathe in and out and hold again for 10 paces. Then let go with normal breathing for about a minute. Then increase it to 15 paces. Then with normal breathing for a minute, continuously moving, 15 paces again, then 20 paces, then 25 paces, then 30 paces. Now your airways are opening. But it's even more because it's also going to influence oxygen delivery to the working muscles. So you were saying that you were warming up so that your muscles, you're preparing your muscles so that you feel better. But we have to ask, what about the oxygen dissociation curve? So when you take air into your lungs, 
oxygen transfers from your lungs into your blood. In the blood, oxygen is carried bound by hemoglobin. How do we get hemoglobin to release the oxygen to the working muscles? You increase the temperature of the muscle. More oxygen gets delivered to that working muscle, but also you increase carbon dioxide. That causes a drop to blood pH. More oxygen gets delivered to the working muscle. So by doing those breath holds as part of your warm up, you increase oxygen delivery to the working muscles. You also prepare your lungs, but you also prepare your head because mm -hmm. it increases blood flow to the brain. And this is the difference between the Wim Hof method and what we're doing, although we do some hyperventilation as well. If you hyperventilate, you're getting rid of a lot of carbon dioxide from the blood to your lungs. This is driving up your blood pH. Blood vessels are constricting. Hemoglobin is holding on to oxygen. This is putting you into a stress state. But because you've got rid of so much carbon dioxide during the hyperventilation, you've depleted your alarm to breathe, so you can hold your breath now for a fairly long time. Then you hyperventilate again, you get rid of even more carbon dioxide. And then the second cycle, you're gonna hold your breath for even longer. And then you breathe in, hold your breath for 10 seconds and then hyperventilate again, 30 breaths. And then you have your exhalation, you hold and you hold your breath for a really long time because now your carbon dioxide levels are very low. However, the question we have to ask is, if you hold your breath for such a long time, and your blood oxygen saturation is going below 50%, 40%, 30%. It can involve a reduction of blood flow and oxygen delivery to the brain. Do we want that? And I don't think we don't. I've said, and I put my hand up and I said, yes, I've made plenty of mistakes and I fucked up. I would not teach hyperventilation and long breath holes because I think it's, we don't fully know the answers there. Yeah, I'm true. only putting it out there. If yeah. I say Tyson, people get back to me and say I'm a competitor. I'm not. I'm yeah. absolutely, that's not, like, I understand breathing because I've been on the cold face of it for 20 years. And I've worked individually with about 8,000 people. There's a lot of people teaching breathing exercise in small groups or in larger groups, but they haven't actually seen the effects. It's totally different if you're working with it over a long period of time and you start tweaking it. And this makes you, you understand it. Breathing is more powerful. Now, then you can ask, well, what about free divers? Free divers don't typically hyperventilate before they get into the water because it's too dangerous. So they breathe in, breathe out and hold their breath. Carbon dioxide is intact. Now, that means that as they do a long breath hold and their oxygen levels are dropping, carbon dioxide is increasing. So on one hand, while oxygen is dropping, the other hand, carbon dioxide is increasing. And as carbon dioxide increases, it increases blood flow and oxygen delivery to the brain. Wow. So a diver, free diver, <clears throat> isn't going to experience hypoxia of the brain, possibly to the same extent as somebody who is hyperventilating and doing long breath holds. Yeah, it's really interesting. I was, I was going to ask a question really in line with that. I was, uh, based on what you're, you're saying, from what I understand, is uh, you know, our ability to be actually... Uh, be able to handle that that um, CO2 buildup is a beneficial thing to an athlete. So, you know, developing yes. that bold score, whereas the flip side of that is like, if you're getting rid of all that CO2 and just relying on the oxygen, it sounds like almost an opposite practice to, uh, to what the oxygen advantage is. It, it, does that make sense? So doing that Wim Hof method, if yes. you're just loaded up yeah. on oxygen, it's like, okay, it's well, what's the advantage to my ability and, uh, you know, capacity to build a bold score through this? Yeah, it, I'm, it's really difficult to know whether it's going to improve both score because it's a hypocapnic training throughout. And that's only, I've only got the, the results from Matthias Cox's paper where he shows the blood gases and you look at them and you can see what's going on in terms of the breath holds. And at the start, even before individuals did the test, the pressure of oxygen in the blood was higher, which is indicating that they're hyperventilating and carbon dioxide is already low. And this is even before they started. So I'm not sure in terms of where the individual's hyperventilating, even before the first measurement, because their blood gas are already off. Um, like, it's not that I'm not against the hyperventilation, and we do some hyperventilation, but I think it's very important that it's controlled. And I would also say is, whenever you do hyperventilation, is to use a pulse oximeter. Uh, so use, mm -hmm. use a little device, and especially just make sure that you keep your blood oxygen saturation above 50%, mm -hmm. like even above 60%, because 
even if you drop your blood oxygen saturation below 88%, you're going into severe hypoxia. We always try and have people at 85%. That's where we're looking for. It's severe hypoxia. Is there any more benefits of going into 70 or 60 or 50 or 40 or even 30? You know, there's a lot of, going to be a lot of diminishing returns and there's more of a risk without seeing those additional benefits. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think people should get a, get a good pulse oximeter. They're about $25, $30. You get an inexpensive one that's accurate. And you could do what we do now with the newer book. I put in a hyperventilation exercise, hyperventilate breathing hard and fast in and out through your nose for 20 breaths. It's a full breath in through your nose and a full breath out through your nose, full breath in, full breath out for 20 breaths. Then exhale and hold your breath until a moderate to strong air hunger, but don't overdo it. And you can be monitoring your blood oxygen saturation and then breathe light for three minutes afterwards. So you're stressing the autonomic nervous system by doing hyperventilation and you're stressing the autonomic nervous system by doing that long breath told, but then you're bringing the body and mind into relaxation. So you're stressing relaxation, stress, relaxation, stress, relaxation, recovery is just as important, if not more important than the stressor itself. Mm. One of the things that I wanted to ask you about uh, before we before we finish up is uh, I feel like years ago or five or 10 years ago, the, the VO2 max test was a really popular, really cool kind of test. And I know it's still highly respected and a number of athletes like to compare numbers there. But just with all of what we're talking about in mind, I'm, I, I'm not sure whether or not there's uh, more efficient ways to measure our body's efficiency with, with uh, you know, oxygen at, at our maximum capacity. But just as a generalized kind of a question, I was, I was curious to know what you thought about the VO2 max test. Yeah, I suppose people, people go with it. Um, and then the question to ask that I ask is, well, can we, can we influence it? And when I looked at the few studies looking at carbon dioxide sensitivity and VO2 max, they found that when individuals have a strong sensitivity to carbon dioxide, they tend to have a reduced VO2 max. The other question then is, so, okay, we want to reduce the chemo sensitivity to carbon dioxide, and is that going to lead to a higher VO2 max? The second question is in terms of, if you can improve oxygen carrying capacity, you will typically improve VO2 max. And breath tolling can do that. You know, you've got two effects there. You've got spleen contraction, and you've also got, when you're doing a long breath told, your kidneys and the liver, to a lesser extent, synthesize the hormone erythropoietin, which causes a maturation of the, the red blood cells, the blood cells in the bone marrow. So I think we can influence it. But like I don't, when I'm working with athletes and I'm working with individuals, I'm working on them. But a lot of them are timing at their personal best or timing shuttle tests or doing different things. Um, but we don't like we don't have our own laboratory, so we're not looking at the the hard facts. So we then have to rely on outside. Yeah, so it's yeah. different. That was interesting. Now, one of my athletes uh, that I, I do some running coaching, and one of the athletes that I'm working with is a distance runner who's targeting a, a marathon, and he mentioned that his VO two max had dropped. And uh, you know, I hadn't. Like, I was a little bit old school. I think I grew up with more old school coaches, so I'd never really uh, got like bogged down in a lot of the science of it i would just uh sure. I, I think i'd go out and do my training and then i'd recover so that was a question uh more for, for him than myself but it is interesting because i think the more i learn about this subject the more i realize it's not a you know it, it's a little bit deeper than than what the surface numbers might make you think yes i would agree and i think the recovery part of it is really really important as well you know if you're talking with dr jay wiles and he would be an expert, expert in heart rate variability. And when he's working with his athletes, if he notices that their HRV is down 20%, he has them go easy that day. Hmm. And if their HRV that day is down 40%, they have to take the day off. And I think this is something now recovery is getting much more attention. Because if you give chance for the body to recover, well, then it's going to improve your resilience your autonomic nervous system is in better balance. You're less likely to burn out. Your head is more likely to be focused. Your sleep is better. And then that sets up the ground rules then for improving performance. So I think, you know, times have changed um, definitely. And 
they've certainly changed with breathing because before breathing would never be never would it you know enter into an athlete's domain you know and like okay yoga breathing but yoga breathing is not going into the depth that that we need to be looking at with breathing Mm -hmm. We, we need to look at breathing from a number of different dimensions we need to look at everyday breathing using breath holds as a stressor using your how are you breathing during sleep does the athlete know if they're feeling ramped up how do they down regulate preparing the mind and body for pre-competition like there's so many different things that can be tweaked here um, and that's what makes it exciting it's a huge field it's mm. absolutely enormous yeah it's really good we might have we might have already covered this but the last question that i was just curious to know outside sure. of the breath holds and things like that was just around the house so someone says okay i'm going to practice this when i'm running well, the rest of my life would be beneficial to practice it as well. Uh, things like mouth taping or just holding your breath. Or are there any just other simple practical things that we can apply just in like a, a you know a little daily routine, um, like a yeah. bite size kind of thing that we can take away to to really yeah. uh, improve our running as well? Like in terms of mouth taping, that was a game changer for me. It was in total in '98 I started that myself, and I was waking up feeling alert. I never had that. I was always tired of waking up. You should never wake up at a dry mouth in the morning. And by the way, if I can show you this, this is the tape that we use, just in case, because people often think that you're taping your mouth, you're putting mouth tape right across your lips. No, we, we use a tape that's stretched around the mouth. And this one here now is the, the beige color. There's also a blue one now. And it's pulling the lips together and it's stimulating the orbicular sores. But if the person, if there was an emergency, they can revert to mouth breathing. So there's a tension there. Mm. And I would really say to people, first and foremost, get your mouth closed during sleep. Your mental fatigue is going, or sorry, your mental alertness is going to be much better. And that is a huge component. You know, if you're walking about your house, you will be thinking about breathing no slow and low, or if things, if things go wrong, how should you breathe? Take a soft breath in through your nose and a really relaxed and a slow and a gentle breath out. So if you have a really slow and relaxed breath out, your body is telling the brain that everything is okay. So this is something that you could be doing pre-competition if you're feeling ramped up. Now, you don't want to go out too relaxed. So if you want to upregulate, well, then you can take a couple of big breaths. One big breath, two big breaths. Not too many that you get rid of too much carbon dioxide. Or you could do a few breath holds. Breathe in through your nose, breathe out, hold your nose and jog. And that ramps you up because it increases blood flow. So there's a way to downregulate and there's a way to upregulate. Like I've some videos on YouTube as well, Atomic Focus. And it looks at breathing in terms of changing states. And then it looks at awareness. So about getting into flow states. You know, that state of mind whereby everything is flowing with your full attention absorbed in what you're doing. Can we achieve flow states if we have poor sleep? Mm. can we achieve flow states if we have dysfunctional breathing i don't think we can i think in order to get into that flow state we need to have functional breathing the autonomic nervous system needs to be in good balance and we need to have good sleep and that's setting us up then for flow awesome man patrick thank you so much for uh for coming on man there's there's so much in that i could talk to you all day i'm I know I'm already going to hit reset on the book and just listen to it again to make sure it's all absorbed. But hey, really, <laughs> sure. really appreciate it, man. I, uh, you're doing great work. It's I know how beneficial it is in the small time I've been doing it, at least to, to the alertness and um, that just sense of well-being and waking up fresh with things like that. So hey, thanks so much for coming on. If you've ever, ever got anything else to share, just uh, just hit me up. But yeah, thanks again, man. Great stuff. My pleasure. Right. Thanks very much, Tyson. I'll see you later. See you, everybody.